let me uh, start with a brief introduction about myself. First of all, I'm more conveniently referred to as TD for obvious reasons. Uh, so I, um, I used to be in the UC Berkeley AMP lab that Joey referred to earlier. And so that, and that's where I started building uh, Spark Streaming with Matei and it was our grad, our grad school project which turned out to be something much larger than what we imagined. Um, so, and right now, I'm, it's been almost four or five years since then, and right now I'm focused on actually building the next generation beyond Spark Streaming, which is Structure Streaming. And so I'm an engineer at Databricks. Uh, we are, I'm part of the stream team, and our team motto is we make all your streams come true. I'm also a, a PMC member of Apache Spark. Okay, so here is your one slide about Spark for those three folks. Uh, Spark if you, uh, is a unified processing engine that allows you to build all sorts of cool big data applications, be it streaming applications, machine learning applications, graph processing applications in Java, Scala, uh, Python, R, whatever language you prefer. It allows you to build all, these, all sorts of cool applications that read data from all different kinds of storage because Spark can talk to a lot, a lot of them and allows you to run those applications on a lot of different environments, be it uh, GC2, uh, Guinea Cloud, Hadoop Yarn, Mesos, and we recently added Kubernetes in the last Apache 2.3 release. So, hopefully you're all up to speed. Everyone knows exactly what Apache Spark is. Uh, okay, so I'm here to talk about, actually, about data pipelines. And this is something that pretty much every company dealing with data has to build. You guys know about that. But here is where I would like to start uh, from our perspective on it. This is uh, data pipelines in a 10,000 feet view. And, and many data pipelines just kind of at a high level fit into this model. You have unstructured data streams of data coming in. You, uh, the first step is actually dump it as fast as possible in, in the possibly unstructured form with maybe a little bit of cleanup and stuff. But then there's usually a separate process that is going to ETL the data from your data lake where the data is dumped into a more structured uh, form in some sort of data warehouse. And then the data is ready for further analytics, like doing what, whatever sort of analytics you want to do. Now, this high level looks clean, understandable. But the implementation of this is really clean. So here is a data pipeline of a Fortune 100 company that Databricks is currently working with. And this is how it looked like w before we came in. So they had trillions of records coming in from all their network infrastructure, their server infrastructure in their own data center. Uh, they, they have bro logs, a lot of uh, low level logs, uh, application level logs all coming in and being dumped in multiple data lakes spread across multiple clouds. And, uh, and then th there's usually a separate complex ETL process to read all those out, ETL them and put them into multiple uh, dedicated data warehouses. And there are multiple because each data warehouse is kind of designed and tuned for uh, one particular uh, end use case. For example, uh, alerting is, requires a certain kind of database. Reporting requires a different kind of database. Uh, searching would require a different kind of data warehouse. And so, so they had essentially this messy architecture of multiple data lakes, multiple data warehouses, and things don't very well integrate across each other, et cetera. So besides the general messiness of the whole thing, what the major problems they had, which is why they came to us, is that you have hours of delay in accessing the data from the, data, from the time when the data is generated at their servers or network equipments, by the time it reaches the data warehouse where they can do useful stuff with it. It is hours, really hours. And that was not acceptable when they have want to do critical stuff like intrusion detection as fast as possible and things like that. And each of these systems are very expensive to scale because data warehouses uh, often are not built to really scale horizontally. They are, and data is locked in very proprietary form as so. so Pulling data out from the, the structure it out from those data warehouses can be often clunky, slow, etc. And they did not have any support for any sort of advanced analytics like machine learning and stuff. Because those data warehouses were not designed for specifically for those purposes. So when we came in, we saw them, we worked, we worked with them, figured out a cleaner approach, and that led to something like this. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So we replaced 
their complex ETL logic, et cetera, to, with something like uh, with Spark, Spark structure streaming. That's going to be my, my main focus of today's talk. The, in terms, rather than use their uh, storage solutions of uh, variety of data lakes and data warehouses, we went ahead and uh, uh, designed and built Databricks Delta for them. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that towards the end. And then what Databricks uh, Delta solves their uh, storage problems in such a nice way that now you can use Spark for any kind of operations, like uh, for all the downstream requirements, like uh, alerting, monitoring, etc. All of them can be built on top of just these two systems. So, and that essentially allowed the data to be usable within minutes, if not seconds. It was easy to horizontally scale all of these. All the formats are essentially open, so you can you're not locked into a particular data warehouse solution. And it, of course, it was built on Spark, so it automatically enables advanced analytics like machine learning, etc. You can integrate all of that in the same uh, in the same open ecosystem. All right, let's talk about structure streaming first. The way I would like to present usually uh, about structure streaming is to start with the philosophy. The philosophy uh, that we had. The re sort of the realization we had when we designed structure streaming is that the end user, that is you, should not have to reason about the complexities of streaming. Late data, uh, out of order arrival, all of these complexities, figuring out what to do, when to drop data, etc. Sh you should not have to reason about all of these. You should have to simply write simple queries as if you're processing batch data. That's usually simpler. And it's Spark's job to automatically figure out how to convert that uh, simple query into a more incremental uh, streaming version so that that can run on streams. So to do that, we realized that we need a one simplifying, simple unifying abstraction. And we realized that tables are essentially that one unifying abstraction. You can have tables. You can have your streams be treated as tables. Essentially, every uh, new data or new record that arrives in a stream, it's like a new row being appended to uh, two tables. And so we have these tables as a, a common abstraction that can represent both unbounded data, uh, which are streams, as well as bounded data, which are batch tables. So let's to understand how this unifying abstraction helps, let's walk through a simple example. Uh, it may be simple, but it often building something this simple in other systems becomes very clunky and complicated. So let me demonstrate how easy it becomes in this system. Uh, for example, uh, let's say you have a JSON data coming in through Kafka. What you want to do is parse the nested JSON in a, into more structured form and write it out as Parquet so that you can now do interactive queries on that Parquet table. And obviously, you want to ensure end-to-end -end fault tolerance guarantee so that you don't want to drop data or have data duplicated. So to start with this, first you need to define what your source of the data is. And that's these four lines of code where you're specifying that I want to read from data uh, from Kafka, which is the format Kafka. I want to, where do I want to read from, which is um, the, what servers Kafka is, what topic I want to read, and load it. And so, Kafka is among the few uh, built-in support. For, uh, we have files, and, and we have also have Kinesis in our Databricks offering. And you can also combine data from multiple different sources using union, join, etc. What this returns is essentially what, what we call a data frame. And, da and data frame is a programming, the main programming abstraction for Apache Spark. Uh, so data frame, the, 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 the simplest way to think of data frames is that they are semantically equivalent to a table. It's a bunch of rows which have a well-defined schema. And, since, and, and going back to the unifying model, the tables can be both uh, bounded and unbounded. Data frames can be both uh, represent both static data as well as streaming data. So it, you have this single API for representing both kinds of data. And, and the, the cool thing about data frame is that there are multiple different variations of the API that you can use to program, depending on whatever you're comfortable with. For example, these did, uh, the Spark data frames are very similar to Python pandas or R data frames. For those who are familiar with it, typically data scientists are more familiar with those set of things. Uh, you can uh, you can express your business logic in pure SQL and 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 get data frames out of it as well. 
Uh, typically, BI analysts are more familiar with SQL. And then if you want to write something a lot more complex, like very custom processing uh, in a map reduced style fashion, you can write, uh, you have this variation of data frame called data set, which are essentially statically typed data frames. And so there you can write your function literals and lambdas in a fully statically typed uh, language like Java and Scala. And uh, you get full compile time type safety for, for complicated stuff. And um, not to pigeonhole that one, one uh, data scientist should use this and data engineer use this. The, the, the nice thing is that you can pick whatever hammer uh, you want to use for whatever nail you have, and you get the same semantics across all these different variations and the same performance guarantees. You're not restricted to any using one or the other. So going back to the query, so what this returns is essentially a Kafka, uh, a Kafka data frame where uh, and where each row is like a record inside Kafka, and, but it, it, it kind of expresses each row in terms of this uh, clear schema of uh, these columns where we have the binary key, the binary value, the topic, and the partition where uh, the, the record came from, the offset of the record, and the Kafka timestamp. So now, since it looks like a table, it behaves like a table, you can do all sorts of operations on it like a table. For example, let's do some transformations. So here, remember what I want to do. I want to basically treat the data inside Kafka as JSON and parse it out. So that's what I do. If I cast the uh, binary value to string and then apply this function called from JSON on, uh, with a specific schema uh, to, 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 <coughs> to parse out the data. And from JSON is one of the hundreds of built-in SQL functions that automatically uh, are, are super optimized based on because we have been optimizing that for la over the last two, three years uh, that you can use to make all your complex processing much easier. And you can obviously write your own user-defined functions. You can write your own lambdas. You can write your own map reduce style functions. Uh, you can invoke machine learning models uh, through that. So all of that can just fit into these, this uh, data frame data set programming interface. Finally, we want to write the data, the, the, the parsed out data out into Parquet. So that's what you specify as a sync. We transform um, and, and so you can specify, in this case, we are specifying that we want to write it out to a parquet format into a particular path, which is our parquet table. And uh, while we have native support for files in Kafka, uh, you, there's also a method called for each, where you can specify your arbitrary code to write it out to arbitrary systems. And, uh, de and depending on your sync implementation or your for each implementation, if you write it out transactionally, then you get end-to-end -end, uh, fault tolerance uh, exactly once guarantees. But to get that, uh, you also need to specify two more things. One is checkpoint location, which is where th uh, uh, the, the Spark will essentially save all the necessary data to uh, figure out how much it has processed and therefore what it needs to reprocess, fault tolerance. And that is the one that crucial for getting the exactly one's guarantees. And also you need to specify thing, uh, more processing level details like trigger uh, which is how do you want to actually execute it? When do you want to emit data? Do you want to emit data every one minute or every 10 seconds or uh, continuously, which is a new execution mode in Spark 2.3? I'll talk about it later. So you need to sp specify these processing details and then call start. When you call start, what happens is that uh, Spark, t the, the, the course, the Spark SQL engine, uh, takes uh, this query, be it in data frames, data set, or SQL, and converts it, converts it into a standardized logical plan. Then it converts to, a, uh, to figures out wh what is the best and optimal way of e executing this logical plan into a more optimized plan. And from that optimized plan, it essentially figures out how to run this code incrementally on its, uh, automatically, and, therefore, and, and, and generates a series of incremental execution plans, which executes new batches of data as new data arrive on the streams. So Spark takes care of automatically streamifying your query from uh, the, the very batch table-like query that you've written. And it also automatically takes care of the checkpointing based on uh, the checkpoint location you have provided. It's usually HDFS, S3, or some sort of fault-tolerant storage format where um, Spark will save all the necessary offset information, like what Kafka offsets have been processed. To, uh, it will save it in a 
using JSON in a, so that it's future, it is always f f forward compatible. Uh, g g it is always for forward compatible. And uh, with that, you get exactly into one's guarantee. And you also get the guarantee that even if your code changes within certain constraints, uh, you can always uh, recover and start where the previous version of the code left off. And then this is often very useful where, uh, let's say, you, have, you receive some corrupt data and your query failed because it couldn't handle it. You can add an additional filter to filter those corrupt data out and start where it left off. Going back to the query, so this is what we started to build. And what the end result is that you have this query that can uh, convert unstructured data from Kafka to in a structured format of Parquet, making that available for further downstream processing within seconds. This is great. And this is, this, uh, when, we did, when we did this a uh, couple of years ago, uh, this was by far a, a very different and a leap forward than what was possible uh, without before structured streaming. And this, by the way, is really fast. So for example, we built uh, the Yahoo benchmark to run um, uh, on both Spark and Flink and, uh, we, uh, and to compare the raw throughput performance. And in a 40 core, 10 cluster setting, we were almost 3x faster than the nearest computer Apache Flink. And for you guys, that essentially means for your requirements, it'll, you, you'll, it'll be 3x cheaper to run on Apache Spark than anywhere else. So. Let me focus on another aspect of this query. So note that the core business logic of how you're transforming data is in just in these couple of lines. Whatever is around it is essentially peripheral code that specifies where, the read or, uh, where to read and write from and how to process. But in this case, if you just flip the, that peripheral code to, re, to use read and write instead of read stream and write stream, then your query automatically becomes a batch query, not a streaming query. And the, co the cool thing is that your business logic remains completely unchanged. Whatever uh, complicated map function, reduce function you have applied, all of that doesn't need to change at all. Because it's the same API, same statically typed API. It's exactly the same. So you can build libraries of these transformations and just use it in whatever context you want. So you write your business logic independent of what is your future execution mode going to be. And for, in terms of execution mode, you there have, therefore have three choices. Either you want to run it as a batch, for, uh, as a batch job or an interactive job, which if you want to do it periodically in your data pipeline, you will have hours at best minutes of latency. But you can execute on demand. You can optimize your, uh, your, your you know, execution costs very well, schedule it at, uh, on, sp on spot nodes and stuff but you are going to get really, really high throughput. You can choose to put it on our, the default streaming execution engine, the, the micro-batch engine, and you get low latency of the order of seconds. But you also still get the same high throughput because it's reusing the exact, all the same machinery that the Spark batch engine is using, the core Spark SQL optimized engine. And in, recently, as of uh, last month in Spark 2.3, we also have this continuous streaming mode, which gives you ultra low millisecond level latencies uh, at the cost of slightly higher resource usage. Because unlike the micro batch model, here you are statically allocating resources in the cluster to, uh, to continuously process data, as opposed to in micro batch, where you are, uh, you are um, gathering resources as and when data arrives. So it is much more, so one is more efficient, the other gives you lower latency. You have the, uh, you have the ability to choose what execution mode you want without your query changing. So 2.3 has an experimental release which works on non-aggregation, just simple ETL kind of stuff. I highly encourage you to try it out. The next step usually that people do beyond this simple ETL kind of pipelines are event time aggregations. And, and by event time aggregations, people usually think of windowing, windowing based on the event time. And in, in our API, windowing is just another form of grouping. Essentially, you're taking every record and putting it multiple groups of windows, what, whichever window, time windows that, uh, that record falls in based on the event time of that record. 
and you can specify, so, so to, 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 to specify this windowing, you have to specify what is the timestamp column and what sort of windowing do you want uh, in terms of uh, how the window length and, the, and how, how the window moves. And so you, speci you can specify only time-based windows. Uh, and you can uh, combine that with other kind of grouping as well together. Uh, this is very SQLish and stuff. And of course, we support user-defined aggregate functions as well. Underneath, under the hood, what happens is that to, to continuously uh, compute these uh, aggregations, your, the engine needs to remember what was a partial aggregate every time uh, a new data is processed so that it can continue the, where it left off. And, and the way it is done is basically by maintaining distributed state in the cluster. Um, so on, Given the, given the Spark cluster on all the worker nodes, uh, this, this state is maintained as in-memory state, although it is backed into, uh, as a writer log in HDFS, any state changes. So uh, what happens is that in every micro batch, it reads the previous state, updates the aggregates, and writes out as new state to be, and, and automatically synced to uh, the fault tolerance storage, S3, HDFS, whatever. And this all happens seamlessly under no hood. You don't need to worry about it. All you need to do is specify the checkpoint location, and it takes care of everything. And you get the same exactly once fault tolerance guarantees that you expect out of Spark. This way also automatically handles late data. And this is why uh, the user doesn't really need to worry about it uh, too much. Um, so if, if you happen to receive, if the engine happens to receive some record that is out of order and late, all it will do is it will automatically figure out that, oh, it needs to update an older bucket rather than the newest bucket it was uh, actually updating. And since all of that information is already present in state, it will just go ahead and update uh, the, the right bucket and therefore late data gets taken care of automatically. But the side effect of that is that the engine really doesn't know when to stop updating old buckets, when it can kind of close the bucket and say, nope, I'm not, this is not going to be updated, so I'm just going to th not throw it out of state. Um, and, and because it doesn't know, it can never throw out anything, so the state will keep growing indefinitely. To avoid doing that, you, you, you don't want that to happen, usually because more state means more memory, more resource requirements in the cluster. So to avoid doing that, what, we, we, what we, uh, Spark Streaming supports is watermarking. And for those who are not familiar with what watermarking is, it's essentially like a, a, th a moving threshold that is trailing behind the maximum event time the system has seen. So for example, if uh, at any point of time, among all the records that has been processed, the maximum event time is 12.30 uh, p.m. and you have specified this trailing gap, which is called the watermark delay to be 10 minutes, then the, at that point of time, your watermark is at 12.20. And what, and what uh, the engine can automatically do is that any record that is older than a watermark, that is, that has been delayed by more than 10 minutes, it can automatically start dropping that data. And so, for example, if you're aggregating, then your data, if it, if it is, let's say, five minute delay, then the, it, it is late, but it will be still allowed to aggregate and update the counts. And uh, the, it, the engine will to figure out when to, uh, how much of the state to maintain to get the correctness guarantees uh, within those bounds. But if any record is more than 10 minutes late, uh, then it will automatically be dropped and its corresponding buckets in the state will be automatically cleared out. It's very easy to specify this 10 minute trailing what gap, this watermark delay, by just specifying this method with watermark, what is the event timestamp column, and what is the trailing delay. And the system takes care of automatically figuring out at the run time, uh, when, when it's running, what is the current max event time. So it will automatically track based on the, as data comes in. Um, so the x-axis here is the processing time, which is the real wall clock time. Uh, and as data is coming in, the y-axis, which is the event time, it can uh, move up and down in the event time. Uh, uh, and it, the system will automatically track what is the max event time. And based on that, it will keep updating what is the current watermark, which is the red line here. And based on that watermark value, it will figure out if whether the record is late, but still, old, uh, still uh, above the watermark or if it's 
uh, actually older than the watermark, and based on that, it will decide whether to consider it, it or not. And, and I've de I, I, g g for a lot of these, I have more detailed explanations in my blog post, so please take a look at that. So I, I'm not going to be able to cover a lot of the more advanced operations in structure streaming. We have blog posts and multiple talks about that. So I highly encourage you to take a look at those. But uh, uh, things like st uh, automatic streaming deduplication, uh, we recently added support for stream stream joins. We have always supported stream by joins, but we also have stream stream joins. And we have the ability to do arbitrary stateful processing where you want to do things like sessionization and stuff. And all, in all of these cases, you can use Watermark to uh, automatically clean up state or do custom state cleanup yourself in the case of uh, garbage state processing. Anyways, so going back to the original picture of how we build the new data pipeline uh, using Apache Spark. So the, the second part of this uh, building this end-to-end -end pipeline was Databricks Delta. And since I really can't go into too much detail about one of our Fortune 100 customers on uh, how their things look like, let me use our own example of how we do ETL at Databricks to kind of explain what are the problems we actually faced while using structured streaming alone and how we came up with the idea of Databricks Delta and how that helped immensely us and, there, and, and therefore uh, we made a product out of it and others can use it as well. So, we had the essentially the same problem as most of you face. We have uh, date events coming in from Kafka. These are our uh, uh, usage logs from, we, we, we manage, a, uh, manage a service in the cloud, so it's running on various different cloud environments, AWS, Azure, different locations. We have all the events coming in through Kinesis and Kafka. Now we want to do one, essentially streaming analytics on it. We want to do, uh, uh, build uh, long-term reports on it. And so how do we build this? So when we started building this, we, the first thing we went about was um, we started building streaming analytic dashboards using structure, structure streaming. Where it failed is that we can't, Kafka can store only maybe seven days or uh, maybe few weeks of data. And anything more than that is probably really expensive. Uh, so what do we do about reporting and on, on, on historical queries? So we have to build another pipeline that takes the same data and puts it into data lake. So we have your typical Lambda architecture. We have two different pipelines. Which automatic, and then you, so now with the, with the data lake, we, uh, we can do reporting and stuff. But, that, but then we ran into other problems of having two different pipelines. So these two pipelines, even though you use diff we use the same business logic thanks to Spark uh, Structure Streaming and Spark SQL and data frames, there were still certain kinds of drifts, things that uh, we saw in uh, the streaming pipeline uh, that had to ignore certain amount of late data, but the, the actual batch pipeline had all the data. Sometimes you need to cross-validate to figure out what is the, the diff between that. And, if cross, and that cross-validation often leads to that we need to reprocess certain parts of the data because um, things were wrong. So that, that, that led to another challenge, that how do you validate across two, these two different kinds of uh, pipelines? How do you reprocess the data, data in the data lake such that it can be kept always correct and stuff, and it's the golden source of truth for any kind of monitoring? The other set of problems that we ran into is query performance. When, when you're dumping data into a data lake from a, from a streaming pipeline, a common problem that you run into is that you have really tiny files because you're dumping data, let's say, every one minute. We, uh, you end up with very, very tiny files. And that leads to a huge blow up in the query processing times because more listing, more file listing, et cetera. It just gets complicated. Uh, so we need to compact the small files as well. But that means, and this, along with that reprocessing we need to do, both of them lead to these sort of complexities like, oh, I want to replace this parquet file with that parquet file. And while in the meantime, the reporting job is actually trying to read those parquet files, what you ended up is getting a lot of file not found exceptions because things are moving around, it's inconsistent. So you need to schedule the reporting to not run at the time where the compaction is running and things got a little complicated. Uh, I see some of you smiling, yes. A lot of our customers also had the same problem, which is what led us to the drawing board that what is the right way of doing this thing? And that's where we did Databricks Delta. So Databricks Delta is 
a storage solution that allows the scale of data lakes. It has a reliability and performance of data warehouses, and it provides the low latency that streaming pipelines require. Let me, so what do I mean by that? And so the, the greatness of data warehouses is that you have data in pristine quality, in purely structured form. You get transaction reliability, and you obviously get fast queries because it's super optimized. Databases are super optimized to do that. Whereas data lakes, you have massive scale on the cloud storage. Uh, you can just dump files onto it. Usually, people do it in really open formats like Parquet and QRC. And because of its open nature, you can do all sorts of complex analytics on top of it, machine learning, streaming, etc. Now, to combine the best of both of these worlds, uh, we we could do these. Well, like for example, Databricks Delta, it's naturally built on the Spark and uh, decouple compute and storage architecture, so it can horizontally scale out re really well. It provides the reliability guarantees of data warehouses because it natively supports asset transactions when updating data and, and data validation, et cetera, things that you expect out of a data warehouse. Data warehouse. You get the performance of data lakes, uh, of, of data warehouses, because it also supports uh, caching and indexing that things that you find only in data warehouses, not typically in data lakes, that well. Uh, the output format is still open, and so you can do all other kind of stuff on it. Uh, so that, that, that has the benefit of data uh, lakes you get there, and all of this can be done at uh, low latency, so it integrates very well with streaming. So this is how our new pipeline looked like, and. Um, this is very similar to the Fortune, 5, the Fortune 100 company that I was talking about. We have data from Kafka, structure streaming writing into a single massive Databricks Delta table, which has all the data in it. So we don't have two different pipelines. There is uh, there's only one pipeline. So, and from that massive data, uh, Databricks Delta table, we uh, spawn out more structure streaming pipelines to create more finer summary tables that are specifically designed and, and optimized for uh, the specific workloads like streaming analytics are reporting. And with this pipeline, going back to the challenges we faced, we don't have the Lambda architecture anymore. It's just one sing single pipeline. We, don't, we really don't need to do validation. Even if we do need to do validation between old and new data, it's all in the same location, so it's much easier. And all sorts of reprocessing and compactionally related problems, the file not found exception, that goes out of the picture because all of this uh, because Databricks supports uh, this, uh, provides transactional guarantees when updating data. Therefore, you will not ever see uh, file not found exceptions and all the nitty, nasty stuff like that. So you don't need to worry about any of that. You can feel free to schedule your reporting whenever and your compaction job whenever. Anyways, uh, to summarize, uh, uh, Databricks Delta is part of the Databricks offering. We have a unified analytics platform to solve all your data processing needs, be it data engineering stuff or data science stuff. And, uh, and, 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 we, and we really build this platform because we, we wanted to build the same kind of, uh, we wanted to help others build the same kind of data pipelines that we had to build ourselves. And uh, structure streaming is essentially a fast, scalable, fault transparency processing engine with high-level user-friendly APIs, whereas Databricks Delta is the other part of the end-to-end -end pipeline solution where it solves all your storage problems by giving the reliability of data warehouses and the scalability of data lakes. You can read more on our blogs, the Sagni Programming Guide, on our Databricks Delta website. <sighs> and if you want to learn more, the, the best place to learn more about the latest and greatest is the Spark Summit, Spark Plus AI Summit now. Um, uh, and it is in, from June 4th to 6th. There are still tickets available. I highly encourage you to, uh, to come at the Spark Summit and talk to us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm wondering whether uh, Databricks Delta is open source. And if it's not, like, what's the kind of architecture and what does it look like internally? Is it something a little bit like Kudu? Or? So Databricks Delta is not open source. It's part of our uh, Databricks Runtime offering, which is uh, Databricks Runtime is the more opti a more highly optimized version of Apache Spark that we offer. And uh, internally, it essentially looks like a bunch of Parquet files similar to a Parquet table, except the, the consistency guarantees of what Parquet files are present, et cetera, is managed by a log that is updated transactionally. So at a very high level, it looks pretty much like a database. There is a log, 
which is updated transactionally, and there is a bunch of files, uh, which in case of databases, it uh, used to be super optimized and coupled with the engine. Here, we just use open formats to save those files. So if anyone wants to access those files from outside, they are, it's, it, they are not blocked from doing that. 